conference and I'll point you towards those uh, during my talk. My second motivation for giving this talk is to get ideas for what to do with this R matrix with time dependence code. RMT is an immensely powerful tool for addressing multi-electron systems in strong fields. Um, but because I spend most of my time dealing with the high performance computing aspects, I feel very ill-equipped and unqualified to imagine what it might be used for. And so my appeal to you, the Adasecond community, is to uh, challenge us um, for things that we can do. There, there are probably uh, th phenomena that we can probe, uh, experiments that we can model that are beyond the reach of other approaches simply because of the nature of, of what RMT is and how it has been constructed over the last half a century. Um, and so, so my, my ask is that you give us ideas for things to do um, and throughout my talk I'll be sort of pointing you towards the capabilities of RMT uh, and uh, inviting you to suggest things that we can do or even offer collaborative ideas, that kind of thing. So what is RMT and what does it do? Well, we're trying to model laser matter interaction. And the way that we do that is to solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Um, but rather than making drastic simplifications to our system and say modeling a one electron system or a 1D system, um, we take full account of the multi-electron effects. Um, and this is really what our matrix theory is built for um, and has been doing multi-electron systems and modeling electron correlation um, in the time independent frame for many decades now. Um, but obviously, we're also interested in these strong field processes and looking at out of second processes. Um, and at the intersection of these two fields is what is technically known as really cool physics. But if you think about the disciplines involved in addressing this kind of physics, we have all of the disciplines of auto science. So that, um, of course, uh, determines the kinds of laser pulses that we want to use and the sorts of spectroscopic techniques that we need to address. And we have the techniques of atomic physics, so our matrix theory itself, and then all of the constituent parts of that, the close coupling expansion, the way that we model the atomic orbitals, molecular orbitals. Uh, and so on. But in order to make this work, because we're trying to address something that's immensely complex, we have to couple to this the third aspect, which is the high performance computing side. And this is where I've spent most of my effort in the last number of years, hence my appeal to you for ideas on the physics front. Um, and when you couple these three uh, disciplines, you get not only really cool physics, but also an awful lot of headaches. This is very difficult to make work, but um, we, the, the wonderful group of collaborators that I, uh, that I work with, uh, um, have put a lot of work in the last number of years really to give us this method that does something really special. So what is R matrix theory, first of all? Well, the basic idea in R matrix theory is that you want to describe a multi-electron system. So here we have our multi-electron system, um, in this case, uh, an atom, and we want to describe all of the electron correlation effects. So all our matrix processes are, are, are sorry, all our matrix methods are built on this idea of what we call the division of space. So we create this artificial sphere in space which surrounds our multi-electron system and we say well within this sphere we really are going to take account of all of the multi-electron effects and in particular we're going to model the electron exchange which is the thing which is actually very computationally arduous. Um, but perhaps during our calculation or during the physical process we're modeling, uh, an electron escapes from this region. So say, for instance, through um, tunnel ionization or maybe, maybe uh, photo ionization or even electron scattering. Uh, now this electron, this ionized electron, is isolated from the residual ion. So this electron occupies a different physical space from the residual ion electrons. And thus we can neglect the electron exchange because that is, effect is, is negligible. And effectively this single electron now moves in the long range potential of this multi-electron residual. Uh, and so by dividing space in this way, we're able to solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation in the inner and outer region separately. And then the R matrix provides us the interface between the two regions. So we're, what we're doing is we're coupling um, a very complicated but rather small region of space um, to what is a much simpler but in principle rather large region of space. And by doing that, it allows us to focus our computational effort in the region where it's really required. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the R matrix is what couples these two regions together. Effectively, it provides us the boundary condition for the propagation of the wave function in the two regions in both directions, uh, population flowing out and into this R matrix sphere. 
So the RMT method, the time dependent version of this approach um, was first reported in 2011 as paper by Laura Moore. Um, and then in the subsequent years, we worked to address um, various computational aspects and in enhance the capability um, in order to really be able to model out of second physics, okay? So not really looking at, not just looking at photo ionization, but in a time dependent framework, but really to look at more um, strong field processes. So in preparing my slides for this uh, meeting, I, I found my slides from the last cost action meeting that I spoke at in 2016 in Edinburgh. And I thought I could take the conclusion slide of that talk and use it as the jumping off point for this talk. So in 2016, what I reported is that we had this RMT code, which was able to describe atoms in linearly polarized pulses. And those, those were both restrictions on the method. We were only able to describe atoms at that point, as I explained, we've now expanded to look at molecules. Um, and also we were restricted to look at linearly polarized pulses. Um, and what the method was able to do that other methods couldn't was to give us a full account of the multi-electron effects. And this allowed us to address a number of uh, sort of strong field phenomena taking account of those multi-electron effects. So for instance, we looked at high harmonic generation. So in particular, I've been interested in looking at XUV initiated high harmonic generation. So this figure is from a paper we did on XUV initiated high harmonic generation in neon. And this secondary plateau you can see here is due to the inner valence electron, whereas the, the strong red feature is due to the outer valence electron. Uh, we were also able to look at things like photoelectron spectroscopy, although this looks more like um, a figure from uh, uh, Laszlo Nagy's talk yesterday, sort of photoelectron holography. Here we were looking at the recollision rings, um, and this was for a negative ion. So we were looking at recollision processes where the electron was recolliding re with a neutral. Um, and other things like out of second transient absorption spectroscopy. So this figure actually uh, Thomas Pfeiffer showed in his talk yesterday. This was work that we did with him modeling out of second transient absorption spectroscopy, where we were looking at the dark states in neon. So those are some of the things we were doing in 2016. And what I proposed in the conclusion slide of my talk in 2016 was that there were four areas where we could expand RMT and where we had plans for extending the method. And those four areas were looking at um, double ionization. Okay, so implicit in this R matrix methodology that I'm talking about um, is the idea that you can only have a single electron moving outside of this uh, inner region. Um, but we had an idea of how we might extend that paradigm in order to address double ionization. And indeed, in 2016, we already had a prototype um, calculation looking at helium, so just looking at, at the two electron system. Jack Rag, our colleague at Queen's, has worked on that during his PhD. And subsequently, um, not much has happened with that, but we have just been funded for a project looking specifically at double ionization processes. So myself and Greg Armstrong at Queen's will be developing a double ionization RMT code. Um, Martin Plummer will be helping us with some of the computational aspects of that. And Carla Faria at University College London will be developing her Coulomb quantum orbit strong field approximation method, um, which is a semi-analytical approach um, to address double ionization processes as well. And the reason I show this slide here today is because, as you can see, the postdoc position with Carla in London is as yet unfilled. That's a three-year position. Um, so if you have a background in semi-analytical theory and you're interested in looking at double ionization processes, um, go ahead and scan that QR code. The applications uh, for that post are open at the minute. That's all I'll say about double ionization processes then, because my, for the remainder of my talk, I want to concentrate on the three uh, extensions that we have actually implemented in the last four years, which is to look at arbitrary polarization, look at extending our methodology to address molecules as well as atoms. And finally, I'll look at some of this spin um, relevant stuff that we've done with RMT. So the first of these then is the arbitrary polarization case. Um, and we have a clear physical motivation for looking at arbitrary polarization, which is that from the laser side, okay, in out of second experiments, very often people are using non linearly polarized pulses, so elliptically or circularly polarized pulses, um, or perhaps some cross polarized pulses, or you want to um, say like the omega 2 omega studies that Neil Dudovich was talking about yesterday. Uh, but also, um, if we want to address molecules, we really need to be able to address the geometrical um, side of molecules, and that will require us to, be, to describe um, the, the geometry of our system. But from a theoretical perspective, this is quite a big ask, because this isn't just some method that we're putting together from scratch. This is built on years and years and years of development, and the entirety of RMT up until 2016 was built just to address the energy polarized pulses. And the reason for that is because it gives you an awful lot of symmetry restrictions and keeps your system very simple. Um, 
So for instance, if you look at the Hamiltonian structure for when we're solving the, the Schrodinger equation, this is for the inner region Hamiltonian in the RMT method, what you can see is that we only have a single symmetry per angular momentum term that we include. Um, that, and that's because we uh, are the magnetic quantum number is a conserved quantity, so we only have ML equals zero terms here. And also the coupling between all of these symmetries is very simple as well. Each symmetry is only coupled to its two neighbors, okay? Um, basically plus or minus one angular momenta as per dipole selection rules. So if we're going to extend our arbitrary polarization, this is going to require us to lift those symmetry restrictions. And in particular, we're going to have to account for the magnetic quantum number because that's no longer a conserved quantity in an arbitrarily polarized field. And we're going to have to account for both even and odd symmetries of each, um, of each angular momentum term. And so what this does to our Hamiltonian structure, you can see is it gets vastly more complex. So we have both even and odd symmetries here in the, in the P um, angular momentum terms. And you can see that we also have ML minus one, ML zero and ML one terms here. Um, so it's not just the number of terms that is massively increased. Also the, the structure of the coupling is, is much more complicated. No longer are we just coupled to nearest neighbors, but this matrix is in general much more dense. So from a computational perspective, this is very complicated and this gave us a lot of headaches actually implementing this in a flexible way. But just to give you a sense of the, the, the scope of this problem, in the linearly polarized case, the number of symmetries that you would have in your description is just governed by the maximum value of angular momentum that you include in your expansion. So for a typical mid-infrared study, we would include something like 100 angular momenta, so we'd have 100 symmetries in our system. When we move to the arbitrary polarization case, if we have an L max of 99, the same as on the left-hand side here, now we move to 20,000 symmetries in our system. Um, and the couplings between those various 20,000 symmetries are also vastly more complicated. And also the electron emission channels, which extend into the R matrix outer region, um, are you know, multiplied up by um, orders of magnitude as well. So this is a very large problem to tackle computationally. Um, and the work for this was done by Daniel Clark uh, and Greg Armstrong at Queens. Um, and now we have a method which is able to describe um, arbitrarily polarized pulses. So we've done several things with this, um, and I don't have time to talk about all of the various things we've done with arbitrary polarization, but I'll just give you one example here, which is when we looked at the out of clock scheme um, for negative ions. So quick refresh on the out of clock scheme, we have a circularly polarized pulse, which means that the electric field vector um, is, is sort of rotating. Um, and we have a very short pulse, which means that ionization is restricted to a particular um, point in time, basically around the peak of the pulse. Um, so what this does is it defines a preferential direction for the emission of an electron wave packet. So in a naive assumption, we would assume that the electrons would come out um, sort of along, say, this axis. Um, but in practice, we find the electrons come out um, offset at some angle. And this angle, it is, well, this is a contentious topic, and I don't want to get into the controversy over it, but you can interpret it in two ways. You can think of it as corresponding to the time it takes the electron to tunnel through the rotating barrier, or you can think of it as the effect of the Coulomb force um, acting on the outgoing electron. Um, and there's some debate as to which of these is the case. And so we decided to get involved in this debate because there was a paper in 2019 by a friend of ours, Klaus Bartschat, and his uh, colleague, Nicholas Duguay, um, talking about doing the out clock scheme for negative ions. And in particular, they address fluorine minus. And the motivation for this is that if you have a negative ion, what that means is your outgoing electron now will be moving in the potential of a neutral. Once you detach that electron, the fluorine uh, neutral is left there. And so in principle, this should eliminate the Coulomb force from your considerations. And you should end, this should then give us a clear indication of what's actually going on with these offset angles. But what they found in their calculation, which was a single active electron calculation, was that in fact, they got a zero offset angle for the particular laser parameters they used. Now, the reason we decided to repeat these uh, simulations with RMT is because we know that the Coulomb force isn't the only force at play here. You also have the electron correlation, and as this photodetachment is taking place, the electrons are speaking to each other and affecting each other, and RMT should pick that up. And indeed, when we repeated their calculations, we found a slight negative offset angle. Um, this is just a, a small angle here, minus two degrees, which isn't very much, but when we change the laser parameters, so in the previous simulations, they were looking at 1.5 micron. When we go to 800 nanometers, we can see that actually this negative offset angle is substantially larger. Um, it's actually minus 12 degrees here. 
Now, there's a number of reasons this could come about. You can talk about the initial velocity of the electron upon photodetachment. Uh, you can talk about depletion effects. Um, but Greg, uh, who did this work, was able to um, uh, dismiss some of those possibilities. And so what we came up with as a, an offering for a solution here uh, is as follows. When the uh, ne negative ion is, uh, is sitting there ready to be photodetached, uh, the electron cloud is, is expanded somehow in order to account for this additional electron. But as the electron photo detaches, that electron cloud will then shrink back. And this contraction of the electron cloud um, can then give rise to this negative offset angle. Now, I'm not going to go into any more detail about this because Greg actually has a poster about this, um, uh, this paper that we did. Um, and it's the first, very first poster in the uh, book of abstracts. So you can read the abstract there um, and you can go and speak to Greg about that in the poster session later on this evening. But this was just um, to give you an indication that with this arbitrary polarization, now we're able to address circularly or elliptically polarized fields. Um, so we're looking at other ad hoc setups, um, looking at various other things that we can do um, with uh, this capability. So the second thing we were going to address then after we looked at arbitrary polarization was to look at molecular targets. Uh, and the reason we were able to do this is because RNT takes as its input the output of various other R matrix codes. So what those other R matrix codes do is solve the time independent Schrodinger equation and thereby provide you with um, all of your dipole matrix elements um, and all of the structural data um, and the, the basis expansion that you need in order to describe um, your atomic system. And so we use two different versions of of the R matrix atomic codes, and that provides relativistic and non-relativistic data for our RMT calculations. But we then expanded um, RMT to address molecular systems by interfacing with the UK RML plus codes. There's a recent um, CPC article about the UK RML plus expansions. Uh, and uh, so it was Denik Maschin and Jakob Bender um, and Jimena Gorfinkel worked on this expansion then to address molecular systems. And I should just mention as well, UK RML Plus features fairly heavily in this conference as well. You can go check out Tom Meltzer's poster, which is about UK RML Plus specifically looking at time independent studies. Uh, and also Jakob has a poster on some of the time dependent RMT stuff that we've done. Uh, and Stenic will give a talk tomorrow uh, about more of this molecular RMT stuff that we've done. So with that in mind, I'm not going to spend too long showing you results. I just give you what we did as a sort of proof of principle for the molecular RMT calculations. And that was basically to reproduce photoionization data for the H2 molecule. Uh, so we're comparing with data from previous R matrix calculations. RMF here stands for R matrix floquet, which is a quasi time dependent method. Okay, but essentially you treat the laser pulses infinite in duration. Uh, so you get really good energy resolution, as you can see here in the ionization rate. And when we do, do these calculations with RMT, what we find is that we get perfect quantitative agreement. Um, and in the regions of the resonances where things aren't quite so spot on, at least we, we capture things reasonably well. And this, in a way, is expected because this is a, a time-dependent approach, but also the, the molecular orbitals that we use and so on are slightly different, so we expect some differences here. Uh, so if we move up towards the one photon threshold, we've got these very large resonant structures. Again, you can see the agreement here is really nice. And even when we move to the four photon energy range, you can see that we capture all these resonances. And so this is really just a, a proof of principle for the molecular stuff. There's actually been a lot more work done on this H2 since then. And I believe Jakob and Zdenek will both present that at this conference, um, in, including um, modifying the molecular orbitals and the description that's used in order to improve this agreement and also then looking beyond H2 to uh, things like water. So that's all I'll say about molecules for now and leave the rest to Zdenek and, and Jakob. Uh, what I want to finish by looking at is some very recent results that we've got by uh, incorporating a description of spin in our atomic RMT calculations. So what we have is a semi-relativistic description. We're using the bright poly uh, formalism. Uh, and what that provides us with is a description of the spin orbit effect, which gives rise to a splitting in energy levels. So um, this becomes very important if you're looking at inner shell processes, for instance, where the, that splitting would be very large. And in principle, what we're interested in looking at are the signatures of this spin orbit effect in strong field processes. So what we're what we proposed when we when we looked at this in the first place was that if you have a very large energy splitting, say for instance in the 4p or 4d shell of xenon, then you do a strong field experiment involving xenon on that 4p or 4d shell. 
the dynamics involving that spin orbit splitting should evolve on the out of second scale because the energy splitting is so is so large uh, and so what we're interested in is finding new dynamics but from the computational point of view obviously this involves a, a sort of complete rework of the way rmt addresses things but now rmt it is able to flexibly address semi-relativistic or non-relativistic data in the same way as it can now flexibly address atomic or molecular systems. So there is a paper published on uh, some of the stuff we've done this already. I'm not going to talk about these results too much today um, because I want to focus on these more recent results. Um, but this was looking at the auto-ionizing states in Krypton. Um, and what we were able to show is this very clear signature of the spin-orbit interaction where you get this oscillation in the auto-ionizing yield dependent on whether or not you have the spin-orbit interaction switched on. And actually, we used the arbitrary polarization capability here as well because we had parallel polarized um, uh, pump probes uh, and cross-polarized pump probe setup, and you see we get this anti-phase relationship between the two results here. So I, I can't really explain more what that's about um, because we don't have time for the details, but you can check out that paper. I think it's a good indication of the kinds of things we can do with this method. But I want to spend my last uh, couple of minutes just talking about these recent results, which I have dubbed the Atomic Wave Plate, which is a slightly more catchy name than the very elongated title in this archive um, article that we've put up. Um, and the idea here is that we are going to use these relativistic dynamics um, to look at uh, controlling the polarization state of harmonic generation. So in a typical harmonic generation setup, you're driving your system with uh, an IR laser pulse. And uh, during the interaction, you generate harmonics. And the harmonics come out polarized in the same direction as your driving IR. So our driving IR here is polarized in the Z direction. And the HHG that we get, the harmonics, which give rise to out of second pulses and so on, come out in the uh, also polarized in the Z direction. And people are interested in, in generating um, different polarization states of these harmonics, because obviously we might want to come up with circularly polarized out of second pulses, for instance. Um, and most of the effort in this field has been looking at modifying the driving IR. So you, you come up with some specialized or specially shaped field, which when it drives your system gives rise to harmonics and the electric field vector rotates and so on. Um, we have instead turned our attention to looking at the target atom itself. And in particular, once we have this relativistic description of the atom and we can control the spin of the various states involved, we've come up with a method of generating harmonics, which are polarized orthogonally to the driving IR. So in this system that I'll show you, what we end up with are harmonics that are polarized both in the Z direction and harmonics polarized in the Y direction. Now, how can we do this? Well, if you think about uh, where these harmonics come from, from a fundamental perspective, radiation comes from accelerated charges according to Maxwell's equations, and the accelerating charge in this atomic system is just the time-dependent expectation value of the dipole. But this dipole, this D here, is a three-dimensional quantity. Okay, it has components in the x, y, and z direction, but obviously we ordinarily we only really care about the component which is um, uh, in the same direction as the driving IR because that's where our states are populated, and so we get z polarized radiation. But in principle, if we can populate states in our system which are coupled by the x or y components of the dipole, we should be able to generate radiation polarized in those directions as well, and that's what we've done. So let's think about what harmonic generation looks like from an atomic physicist's perspective. Um, you have some ladder of states, and these states are coupled by dipole interactions, and those dipole interactions are what give rise to, the, say, the Z-polarized radiation. If, however, we can control um, these states and, in particular, uh, manipulate the quantum numbers, so we can come up with two states here, for instance, we have two sort of sets of states in these two columns, and what you can observe is that the magnetic quantum number of these two sets of states that we have um, written down here differs by one, and what that means is that these states are coupled by the Y component of the dipole. So what the problem now becomes, can we populate states um, in both of these uh, columns? And the spin orbit interaction gives us a route to this because we can't populate these states directly but what we can do is set as our initial state so these two green boxes here designate the initial state we can populate the spin up and spin down components of this particular initial state and then the spin orbit interaction will drive population from this green box into this middle column here and at this point then we populated both the states that we need uh, we've, we've got population in both of these ladders of states and we should see y polarized radiation so that's the basic idea. 
we've actually done these calculations, again, a sort of proof of principle. Um, the target we use for this is carbon plus, because that allows us to access these states um, really easily. Now, I realize that's not a standard target in that a second physics lab, um, but we chose carbon plus because, as I mentioned, it gives us a very clear um, theoretical approach and, and allows us to simplify the analysis a lot. But we do believe that this should be a general phenomena if you can uh, come up with a way of populating the necessary states. So here, here are the results from the RNT simulations. Um, in the Z polarized harmonics, whether or not you include the spin orbit interaction is irrelevant really because the states that you need for Z polarized radiation are already populated. And so what you can see here is that these two spectra are fairly similar. In the Y polarized case, if we don't have the spin orbit interaction switched on, then we don't get any radiation in the Y direction because those state, the necessary states aren't populated. And that's why this is all the way down in the noise here. But if you do have the spin orbit interaction switched on, you do indeed get a harmonic spectrum polarized in the Y direction. So we're excited about this for two reasons. One, it should give us um, a signature of spin orbit dynamics, relativistic dynamics in a sort of at a second physics experiment, like in harmonic generation. Um, and for, on the other side then, from the sort of technology point of view, um, accessing these internal atomic dynamics to, um, to modify the polarization state of harmonic radiation, we think is, is ex an exciting prospect. So just to finish with, I want to give you a rundown of the capabilities just to try and garner any ideas that you might have for what we might do with this. RMT is capable of describing at, the, at present any single ionization process um, it, all the way really from XUV up to IR. So we can look at inner shell ionization, looking at the correlation effects, OJ, decay and all that kind of thing, all the way up to tunnel ionization. We've gone up to 2.8 microns. Um, we can now look at arbitrary polarization, which allows us to look at different orientations of molecules as well. We have this flexible approach to building up the atomic and molecular structure. So we can uh, really see which atomic structure effects or which molecular structure effects actually manifest in um, say a time dependent sphere. And that includes describing the spin for atoms. So we can look at things like spin polarization and so on. And what you get out of RMT is the wave function. And from the wave function, you can get photoelectron density um, in a full time dependent, you know, you can get the time dependent photoelectron density or the momentum density as it evolves in time. We can do rabbit type studies or from the dipole, you can do harmonic generation, transient absorption spectroscopy, that kind of thing. And we're also monitoring the population in all the different states. So you can really see where the population is going as a function of time in these calculations. So as I say, I'm, I'm really looking for your input on what we can do with this incredibly powerful tool, looking at electron correlation in multi-electron systems. And just to finish, I'd like to thank all the people who contributed to the RMT project, especially these people who contributed most to the work that I've shown here today. And thank you for your attention. I welcome any questions. Okay, Andrew, thank you very much for the very nice, interesting presentation. Uh, I think that we have a time for one question. Uh, I can see. And then the I have obviously problem with the discussion forum uh, panel. So may I ask you something? Sure. Uh, for me, it was very interesting presentation because uh, I deal with the theory, and uh, uh, I uh, hope that we can uh, start some kind of collaboration on shared experience because we are theoretical and our uh, point of view is a little bit different. And I hope that we can uh, contact you and uh, share your knowledge uh, by experimental side of uh, topics which are very interesting for us. Okay, sure. <laughs> okay, this is a comment more than question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gather, okay. yeah, no, that's fine. Okay, you, if you have another participant have uh, some question, they can uh, ask with you after the session. Uh, now sure. we move on the next uh, speaker. Thanks you again. Uh, the, the Dr. Matteo Lucchini, Lucchini. Uh, and uh, a few femtosecond harmonic radiation for molecular spectroscopy. You have Hello, five everybody. minutes for questions. Okay, thank you very much. Yaleta, can you hear me? Yes, I can okay, hear you. Perfect. Start. You can start. Okay, perfect. So, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and talk about few femtosecond harmonic radiation for molecular spectroscopy. Actually, if uh, 
before Andrew was a bit concerned about talking about atoms, now I'm a bit concerned about talking about femtosecond radiation in an ATOCAM uh, conference. But I think I don't need to convince people here uh, that it's important to study ultrafast dynamics in molecules. And <clears throat> sometimes the point I want to make, uh, at the second passes with a broad spectrum come together with a congested excitation. So this means for several cases, this is, is wanted actually, is what we want. For others, we would like to avoid this in order to get a bit better spectral resolution and still keep enough time resolution. So how can we do that? And this is uh, what I would like to talk with you about today and show the solution we, implement, we implemented, starting from the experimental setup, which is composed by a time delay compensating monochromator, and then talking about two applications, experimental applications we perform. So let's start directly with the setup. <clears throat> In a certain way, this is a rather a common setup. Uh, as you see, we have a uh, few femtoseconds IR pulses centered at 800 nanometers. Those are focused into a gas cell, part of it, in order to generate harmonics. And you see here a comb of harmonics uh, integrated uh, vertically on the position sensitive detector we have at the end of the line. On part of the uh, IR radiation is then taken, sent through a delay line, and recombined with the UV radiation at the end of the line through a drill mirror. Both radiations are focused into an interaction region where we have a time of flight spectrometer and an electro gas tank. So we can perform palm probe experiments. Uh, but what is not conventional is that all the optics that we have in between the harmonic generation and the recombination. And those are the optics that compose the monochromator uh, that has been developed uh, following the ideas of our collaborators from Padua. Um, is composed by two stages. Uh, first, each stage is composed by two toroidal mirrors and one grating. And in principle, one can use a single stage to select the radiation. So the idea is that you disperse it specially, and then with a slit, you select the harmonic that you like. The problem is if you do that, and you select the harmonic as this stage, you still have a front tilt on the harmonics due to the optics. And then you pass from, let's say, 10 femtoseconds in this region to 100 femtoseconds in this region. So you, you are able to select one harmonic, but you elongate it in time. The idea of having a second stage, which is identical to the first one, is to be able to work in a subtractive configuration so that we can compensate from the front tilt. And at this point, actually select one harmonic by keeping its time duration. So we have still 10 femtosecond time duration here but we can select the harmonic we like to use for the experiment. Uh, this is the setup. And the first step, of course, is to characterize uh, the radiation we created. Since we are in the UV XUV region, this is not straightforward. So one can think we are dealing with long pulses to use a technique which is used for the second pass train. And thanks to the previous talks, I don't have to re-explain it, which is called rabbit. Um, just strictly, I mean, just briefly, it is based on the interference of different ionization paths, which involve the absorption or emission of one XUV photon and one IR photon. Uh, the key point is that you need to have interference and you need to collect photoelectron spectra as a function of pump probe delay between the, uh, the second pulse strain and the IR pulse. If we do this now with one single harmonic, what we have is this situation. So of course, we do not have uh, oscillations anymore. We have one line which comes from the direct ionization from our harmonic that we selected. And then we have the side bands. <coughs> so the signal uh, that comes from the two color ionization where you have also one, uh, the absorption of one IR photon on the emission of one IR photon. Those do not oscillate. And even if you increase the IR intensity, you will get more of them, more side bands, but of course, no interference. Means we cannot use the rabbit, we cannot use this interferometric technique. Actually, one could wonder, with this kind of spectrogram, are we still sensitive with, to the uh, chirp of the XUV and IR pulses? Because now we are using very long pulses. Well, it turns out, yes. So if you start from no chirp, and you see the effect of the XUV chirp, for example, you realize that the XUV chirp is elongating the sidebands in delay, of course, and also giving a tilt in energy, and I assume a funnel shape. If you put the chirp on the, XUV, on the IR, sorry, 
uh, then you also elongate the sidebands and you give a tilt which is symmetric actually. They are parallel in energy. This means that if you combine the two, you get a unique feature, um, which is given by uh, the combination of the two effects. And in principle, this means what we want to think to use a uh, phase reconstruction algorithm in a frog crab approach, which is more similar to what is done for the single second pass reconstruction, to get the time duration uh, of XUV and IR out of this spectrogram. Actually, if one uses the more standard reconstruction algorithm, they, they do not perform that well. Here you see the simulated trays, uh, the IR and XUV in time, and uh, the properties of the XUV in spectrum. And you see what is reconstructed by the phase reconstruction algorithm, like the principal component or the least square general uh, projection algorithms. You see they do fail to reconstruct the matrix, and of course, they do not catch the properties, the time properties of the radiation. Uh, luckily, other algorithms that are a bit more robust, like the EPI, Extended Geographic Iterative Engine, manage to, to converge. You see here the simulated traces for the case of one sideband only, or high IR intensities, that means more sidebands. You see the reconstructed agrees very well, and here you see also comparison between the uh, time evolution of the simulations and the reconstruction both for the XV here in spectrum and for the IR in time. Of course, here the agreement uh, with the carriers is uh, so only accidental because we do not have information on the carrier as we do have uh, with streaking experiments. But the important point is uh, this process is robust, this method is robust, and we can then try to apply this to the experiment. So here I show you two traces for harmonic 19 and 27 uh, measured with our setup and two reconstructions. They agreed very well. And from this, we can extract actually the amplitude and phase in spectrum of the XUV radiation from which we get the uh, time evolution of the XUV, showing that we are able to generate harmonic 19 uh, with nine femtosecond time duration in the target region, on the target region, and harmonic 27 with five femtosecond time duration, which is, to our knowledge, the shortest harmonic pulse generated with this kind of setup. I told you before, the two uh, configurations, so the double stage is used to uh, avoid any additional dispersion in the, in the radiation when we select it. But if you look here, you see that you have quite strong uh, dispersion, 20 femtoseconds square and 7 femtoseconds square for the two harmonics. Those do not come from the generation itself, of course, they are too big. Uh, they come from a residual dispersion that is introduced by the monochromator and that cannot be compensated by the two stages because that's the same sign. It originates from uh, the geometry of the monochromator, can be minimized by redesigning all the optics and uh, increasing the distances. And this is very close to, it changes with the energy, of course, becomes smaller for higher energies. Uh, and that's the reason why we go from 20 to 7 from the second square. Uh, and it's very close to the limit that is being calculated for our setup. This means our setup is optimized to the best it can do at the moment. Once we uh, have proven that we can select and generate uh, short passes uh, in the VUV regime, what we can do <coughs> is try to use them to study molecular dynamics. And the first example I want to show you is uh, spot ion spectroscopy time result, of course, in ethylene. Why ethylene? Well, ethylene is the simplest molecule with a double carbon bond, and its ion represents the simplest biological system. And the important point is that the relaxation of the excited state of the ion towards its ground state is known to go through different uh, processes and rearrangements, um, which have been studied but are not fully understood. And all these are known to be very fast. So for example, there is a recent paper uh, from Ludwig et al, uh, which observed uh, a bleaching of the C2H4 plus production yield. Um, when we perturb the molecule, we ionize the molecule with an auto second pass strain, we perturb it with an IR pass. So if you change the delay between the auto second pass strain, so full combo harmonic and the IR pass, you see that you can uh, reduce the production of C2H4 plus, so the, the full ion, molecular ion, and increase the production of C2H3 plus and C2H2 plus. This means you somehow help the molecule to lose one H atom or two H atoms. 
this seems to happen somewhere during the relaxation, lower in energy probably. Uh, and it seems that if you come 20 femtoseconds after the initial uh, ionization with one IR pulse, you can somehow uh, help this process. So this is very interesting because it means that the molecule does something very quickly in the first 25 femtoseconds. Uh, there are hints that the configuration of the molecule where you can start the process of H and H2 loss is uh, located lower in energy around the ground state of the molecular cation. But where exactly this is located uh, is unknown, or at least it's not possible to retrieve it from this experiment. And one of the main reasons is if you look at the spectrum that has been used, and you look at the po initial population uh, of your cation, you see that you can actually populate the first five excited states plus the ground state of the cation. So it's quite difficult to tell uh, apart the different ways uh, where the that the molecule falls to relax to the ground state exterior. Our idea is the following. Can we use the time delay compensating model parameter and somehow slice this through and see uh, each level what it does ideally? So we could go with harmonic nine and uh, populate mostly the ground state. Harmonic 11 populates mostly the first excited state of the cation. And if we ionize the molecule with harmonic 13, we instead put the most of the population on the, these two states, B and C, which are very close in energy. And we can create these harmonics with a rather short time duration because harmonic 9 has been measured to have 15, 15 femtoseconds time duration, 11, uh, 11 femtoseconds, and 13, 8 femtoseconds. The, the lower order is longer because of the residual geometrical dispersion I told you before, which is, which is stronger at uh, low energies. Well, if we use these harmonics to ionize the molecule and we look at the fragments, we see immediately that uh, the different harmonics do produce different fragments. Some um, of the different fragments appearing with higher energy, so with harmonic 13, are not really visible with lower energies, can be explained simply by the appearance potential of the fragments, which some of them lie around harmonic 11, but others do not. For example, the difference between, between uh, C2H3 plus that we observe from harmonic 13, 11, and harmonic 9 uh, is not explained only by this, because you see that uh, appearance potential for this fragment is way below both harmonic 9, 11, and 13. So what we would like to do now is, okay, we concentrate on one harmonic, let's say harmonic 13, we concentrate on the heavy ions uh, for the sake of time. And we look, we add an IR pass to the process uh, at an opportune delay. And we look at the differences in the yield of these fragments, for example. Let's say C2H4 plus, how this changes, as has been done by Ludwig et al. What we see is the following. If we change the delay between the harmonic, na harmonic 13 and the IR pass, we see a, a delayed bleaching, as has been observed with uh, another second pulse strain. And we also see that this delay bleaching does not happen at zero pump probe delay, but happens around 20, 25 femtoseconds after that zero delay. With harmonic 11, we have the same situation. If you rescale them, are almost identical. And this has been interpreted in the following way. You uh, populate the higher states with harmonic 11 and 13 of the molecular cation. Uh, the molecular cation then starts to relax towards the ground state, redistributing the internal energy. And when it reaches the ground state or a lower uh, energy configuration, then it can interact with the IR and the IR can promote H and H2 loss, bleaching the cation signal. If this picture is true, then when we come with harmonic 9, we are mainly already on the ground state, we should be able to initiate this process right away and not 20 femtoseconds later. So these trays should actually move on the left uh, and be centered around zero. And this is exactly what we found. So if you use harmonic nine, the bleaching is still there, but it moves towards zero delay. Uh, there is more there actually. You see that this is broader compared to what has been observed with harmonic 11 and 13. And the reason why is that we are not able to populate solely the ground state, of course. Part of the population goes also in the A state, in the first excited state. Uh, and these, since it's higher in energy, actually, uh, exhibit the delay, the 20 femtosecond delay that was observed with harmonic 11 and 13. If we look at the uh, prediction of the population that we should put on the two states, we found that 65% uh, of the population should be on the ground state and 35 on the higher states. 
And if we look at the ratio between these two thick curves, we obtain 75 versus 25. And given um, the fidelity of, of this uh, prediction actually is a quite good uh, agreement, which allowed us to conclude actually that um, the hydrogen loss seems to happen actually, or the event that triggers then the, the hydrogen loss seems to happen on the cation bond state. And then it takes to the molecule only 20 femtoseconds to relax from the hyperexcited states to this particular point when this process can be a trigger. Uh, there is more in this data, of course. I do not have time now because I want to talk about CO2 as well. Uh, but another striking difference is, as I, I said at the beginning, is a particular located here and the C2H3 plus fragment. You see going from harmonic 9 and 11 and 13 to harmonic 9, you see a huge difference in the yield production. production. Um, and if you look at the H over H2 loss, uh, which actually is told by the production of CH2 plus and CH3 plus, of course, you see that it goes from less than one to more than one if you go from a mic 9 to a mic 11 and 13. Uh, this, is, this, this behavior has been known in literature. It's a static measurement. It doesn't require any pump probe measurement yet. Uh, but the explanation for it is not really uh, unique, at least. So there are uh, theories which say that um, the, main, uh, you know, the, the, the main role is played by a conical intersection located along a, a local CH stretching. And other theories said instead that the torsional motion is what determines the fragmentation and the production of C2H3 or C2H2, or if you want a loss of H2 or loss of H. If we look at our pump probe data now, we have more information, of course, than the static data. Uh, with harmonic 13, so we high energy, we see a derivative behavior. We see bleaching of the signal around zero because probably we create lower fragments, and then increasing when we bleach the cation signal, so after 20 femtoseconds. With harmonic 11, we see the same. With harmonic 9, we see a qualitatively completely different behavior that could be actually fitted with two exponential, and one is rather, rather long. Uh, the idea here is probably uh, between these two, there is somewhere a barrier. With harmonic 11, you can directly go over it and create C2H3+. And with harmonic 9, you are below it. And then if you take other two IR photons, which is possible with our intensities, you have the total effective energy is the same as a one harmonic 11 photon. And then you can actually go over the barrier and create uh, the C2H3 plus fragment. Uh, now, our hope is that our uh, pump probe measurements can help us to discriminate between the two pictures, the one that says the most important thing is uh, H, CH elongation, and the other that says that torsional motion is more important. And we're now collaborating with uh, Francois Remacle uh, within this cost, actually, to find uh, a solution for this. We can now move to CO2. Uh, why CO2? Well, when you excite a molecule with the UV uh, radiation, what you can do mainly uh, is the following. Either ionize directly the molecule and leave it in the low uh, cationic states, as it, as it happens for ethylene in our case, or you can populate some neutral super excited states, uh, which means those are states with higher uh, internal energy uh, than the uh, ionization threshold, uh, which are neutral. Uh, and those states uh, have been poorly studied in the past and they have been studied, but not so much, uh, especially experimentally, because you, to study their dynamics, uh, since they are super excited, they have very, very short, very fast dynamics, you need to have short pulses uh, at the UV uh, energies. So this is perfect for our set. And in particular with CO2, because the second ionization threshold lies around 17 electron volts, uh, so we can access it uh, with our harmonic 11. And it's known to have very fast relaxation dynamics. So we need few femtosecond passes to see it. The situation is the following. Here you have the, the ground state, a cut of the potential surface through a particular internal coordinate, the ground state of CO2. And here you have the ground state uh, of CO2 plus and the first excited state. Just before the first excited state, of course, you have all the series of super excited states, which are neutral. So the molecule didn't lose any uh, electron here. 
Now, we plot only a few of them. There are, of course, many more. And there are some also here below the X state. Um, those states are both bonding and anti-bonding. So if you look in the photosocial cross-section close to the uh, threshold for the transition to the first excited state and the second excited state here, you see all these peaks, they have been attributed to different uh, states, super excited states, uh, labeled with particular names. I don't have time now to go into the details, but each of them have a certain vibrational progression. And with our harmonic 11, we can actually populate some of them. And it's possible to calculate the probability knowing the cross section and the intensity of our beam. So the idea would be populate these ones, then come with one of your photo in a plant probe experiment and ionize the molecule and see what we get. This time, not in photo ion, but in, in uh, photo electron signal actually. And this is the trace you get if you scan the photo electron signal uh, using harmonic 11 and short IR pulse. You see three different kinds of signal, basically. The direct ionization from CO2 ground state. You ionize with harmonic 11 and you leave the molecule in the ground state of the cation, so you get a huge kinetic energy of 3.5 dB, more or less. You see segments, the same I discussed before for the pulse characterization. So you, you absorb or emit one additional IR photon. And then you see here at lower energies, the two color ionization uh, process. What you do, you populate the neutral states, then you'd say you absorb one IR photon and you go to the A tilde state of the cation. Uh, and of course, this time the electron gets way less energy, which is less than one IR photon energy. So it's supposed to be between 1.5 and zero electron volt. If we look more into this signal, we see that it's very rich. We see oscillations. Uh, we see, first of all, two different uh, decay constants. If we take two cuts around one or around 0 0.5 dB, Indeed, we see that the, the one at higher energies has a longer tail, and the one at lower energies became way faster. Uh, with a global fit analysis, which takes into account for all the energies possible to show that there are two components, one that decays slower uh, with a time constant of 165 femtoseconds, and one faster, around 22 femtoseconds, suggesting the existence of two different classes of super excited state, which are bonding and anti-bonding, as we said before. And the interplay between them is actually reshaping completely uh, this signal. If we take the signal and we do a line by line Fourier transform, we can see, for example, that all the frequencies are not equally distributed in energy, in electron energy. Um, they are somehow related to the normal modes of the neutral molecule, the symmetric, asymmetric stretching and the bending, not exactly the same, of course, because we are talking about super excited state. But interesting enough, they are also distributed in energy, which Usually, these situations happen when the final state is a repulsive state. But in our case, we are actually going from uh, a bond bonding uh, state to a bonding state for the cation. This is a result of a collaboration with uh, Regina, Regina de Diridre. Uh, here you see a very simple model in 1D with the ground state of the cation, the first excited state of the cation, and two super excited states with uh, bonding and anti-bonding nature. Uh, since there is a mismatch between the minima of the two potential curves, it is possible to prove that according to the energy distance and the mismatch, we will have actually different, different frequencies at different energies. So what causes the mapping uh, in energy or different frequency comes uh, from, from this mismatch. While other features like the uh, decay of the oscillations and also an increasing energy uh, an increasing delay of the appearance of the oscillations uh, with increasing electro energy can uh, instead be explained by the coupling between the bonding and anti-bonding states. Here you see a preliminary calculation showing the center of mass of the photoelectrons for these two, for these particular states, when there is no coupling with the anti-bonding states here, the blue curve, you see an oscillating uh, photoelectron energy in time that stays the same. If you turn on the coupling, you see both that the oscillations are getting weaker and also that the center of mass of the photoelectron is moving up in energy, which also is mimicking what we see uh, with, uh, with our experiment. So our goal here would be for the future now uh, to uh, compare this with, uh, with the calculation and extract the uh, strength of the interaction between uh, the bonding and anti-bonding super excited states. And this brings me to my conclusion. 
I show you that it's possible to use a time delay compensated model chromator and in principle at the second radiation to convert it to few femtosecond passes uh, keeping their time duration. And these femtosecond passes, in my opinion, very useful to complement the second experiments in molecules, uh, both in combination with uh, photoion spectroscopy, if we want to study uh, the molecular cation, cation dynamics, or in combination with photoelectron spectroscopy, if we want to study uh, ultra-fast dynamics of neutral super-excited states. And with this, I thank you all for your attention. No, Violetta, okay. I'm here. Uh, Marco, thank you for uh, your uh, presentation. And uh, it was uh, very uh, interesting. And um, unfortunately, I had a problem with my uh, uh, screen. I can see discussion forum. And because of that, I can uh, see what participants want to ask you. Uh, I see. So, uh, I can uh, comment. If you let, uh, this is uh, mm -hmm. the at Chem Events team. Um, the okay. questions will show up on the live Q and A tab, not no, the I discussion. Can see. Okay. okay. I, There's I... no questions at the moment. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Uh, there is no question. Uh, okay. There was a question for the previous uh, one. Uh, there is a new question now from mm -hmm. Fernando Martin. I can read if you can't see it. Okay. Yeah, so the question is, what is the lifetime of the super excited states of CO2? Could auto ionization compete with nuclear dynamics? And that's again a question from Fernando Martin. Ah, I see, I see. Uh, that's a very really good question. Actually, I didn't show it in the, maybe I, I can. So I, I guess so, uh, at the moment we are still in the phase where we tried to understand the origin of the signal as it was not so straightforward. Uh, but we do have a hint of auto-ionization somewhere as well. So I didn't show this. This is the signal of the upper side vent. Uh, basically what happens is that you um, ionize the, the molecule directly with a, a harmonic 11 and then you get another IR photon. Um, and then you increase the energy, so you don't end up at 3.5 dB, but you go up to 5 dB. Normally, the sideband, as I discussed at the beginning, it's very narrow and it's a cross-correlation signal between the XCV and the IR. And here you already see that this is not the case. Uh, this one is very broad and has a, a kind of uh, unique behavior in energy with the energy going down on a very long tail. So our explanation is that what happens is you populate these states and then they will evolve somewhere and at a certain point they can auto ionize and emit one electron. And at this point, the electron can interact with the IR and ends up in the sideband acquiring this additional 1.5 dB. And what we see here <coughs> uh, is this descending curve that probably uh, is related to the fact that the distance between the final state and the super excited states is not the same and evolves in time while the internal coordinates are changing. The problem is uh, exactly which state is responsible for this and if is only one state responsible for this uh, is, is very difficult to tell because there are many, many, many states. Even if we are now going with one harmonic, we are populating many of them. Uh, as I showed at the beginning, the population is comparable for some of them. Uh, I think if it's so clean, the signal, most probably they will have very similar character. So it would be possible uh, to, to find uh, the lifetime and extract the lifetime from here probably and assign it to a family of states probably. Uh, we are working on it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you again and we move on to the next speaker. Um, our next speaker is uh, uh, Marco Roberti. Marco, are you here? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, quantum uh, coloration, coherence emerging for molecular apocytum ionization. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and to, for the organizers to organize this great uh, event and giving me the opportunity to present my work. So I'm going to talk about quantum electronic coherences that emerge from a molecular to second ionization event in particular, presenting a study performed with B-spline LCS ADC method. 
so I will start by describing ionic coherence after autocycle ionization. Then I will describe the method that I have developed to model molecular ionization, which is a time dependent method based on the use of B spline and ADC. Uh, and then I will show the results for a, a simulation of a complete uh, attosecond XUV pump X-ray probe experiment on, on pyrazine, and how that this can allow one to recover the coherences that are prepared in the system. So what is the, 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 the basic motivation? So the basic motivation is to understand how electronic coherence can drive photochemical and um, photophysical change in matter, and we know that the, we, we, we in the recent years, lots of attention has been uh, put on the uh, whole migration dynamics that can be generated in bi biomolecules, uh, especially where you have a, a, a photoionization that creates a, a superposition of balanced ionized states, and this leads to an oscillation of the residual charge in uh, in the molecule across the across the molecular skeleton, which is fully electronic and it's eventually done by nuclear motion. And first attempts to resolve it have been performed both using IR probes and both using HRG spectroscopy in recent years. And so the goal of attochemistry would be to use these electronic coherences, which are uh, which drive a quite a very fast dynamics, a time scale from hundreds of attoseconds to few tens of femtoseconds. And due to the coupling between this degree of freedom and the nuclei, lead to the rearrangement of the molecular structure. And the goal would be to be able to prepare this quantum coherence in a controlled way, to be able to probe them, so to, to image these dynamics on the intrinsic time scale of electron, and then to be able to control these coherences and control the outcome of a chemical reaction by means of these coherences. But what is ionic coherence in the first place? So we start from a neutral molecule in its ground state, and then when we ionize it, of course, we, 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 the photoelectron leaves the, the molecular region and, and we have suddenly two subsystems, a parent ion and a photoelectron. And if the photoelectron has been emitted in the same continuum for different cationic states, then this leads to a possible factorization of the full wave function of the n electrons into an ionic time part times an electron part. And this is what we call coherence. And usually coherence uh, can be produced between many states of a molecule, especially of a polyatomic molecule, especially if we use uh, ultra short pulses, attosecond pulses. For example, here uh, in this case, uh, the, the typical spectrum of a polyatomic molecule, in this case is pyrazine, if you ionize it with a 25 EV photon energy pulse, quite broad, uh, with 7 EV bandwidth, as you see, the bandwidth spans many different ionic states of the, of the system, and therefore lots of coherences can be created. And so, as I said, if we assume perfect coherence, nevertheless, we still have to understand what are the, the populations of the produced ionic states. And this, in general, will depend on the laser field parameters. Uh, and, and, and the dependence will not be trivial in general. And, and so we need the model, we need to model ionization beyond the sudden approximation, which has been used uh, for a long time to describe the initial ionization of a molecular system. How do I do it? Well, I use uh, the uh, I use a time dependent description based on the use of a multi center bispline basis and the method that I developed, which is a restricted correlation space ADC, to describe the uh, uh, electron correlation within the molecular system. So, for instance, the time dependent Schrodinger equation of the molecule is solved by the performing these answers to the many electron wave function, where we have an expansion in terms of continuum states. Uh, times uh, an ionic state, plus bound states, including the ground states, which describe the localized states of the molecule and the electron correlations within. And in particular, the states that describe the, the ionization in the continuum uh, are, um, include an expansion of the ionic state into one all and two all one particle configurations. And this allows to describe uh, quite accurately, both the outer balance energy region, where we know that the states of the ion are mainly described by one all, by as a one all configuration, so we are in the Koopman uh, limit. Uh, both the states that uh, we find as we get closer to the double ionization threshold of the system, where we start to find satellite structure and eventually the complete breakdown of the molecular orbital pictures. So all these states are included in the simulations. And uh, 
uh, to these states is attached uh, a, 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 a single particle basis set, which is expanded in base planes. In, for instance, multi-center base plane basis developed by Professor De Cleva and Toffoli during the years, and uh, uh, which allows one to describe the, the oscillations of the electron in the continuum up to some certain maximum distance from the molecular center, which is determined eventually by the size of the box we use in the numerical simulations. And once we have decided what is our answers for the wave function, then we can compute the Hamiltonian matrix and the dipole matrices of the many electron systems. They have a, a, a block structure depending on whether we are talking about states that are ionized in the continuum or that are bound states, describing uh, like excited states of a neutral molecule. And then we introduce also a complex absorbing potential just as a numerical tool to absorb uh, the wave packet at the boundary of the box and, and avoid the reflections that we don't want to deal with. And once we have the description of the many electron wave function of the neutral system, we then compute the density matrix of the ionic system. So we, 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 we trace out the, the photoelectronic of freedom that we assume we are not interested in. So we are not going to measure it in our experiment, for instance. And, uh, and therefore, we obtain this representation of the ionic density matrices on the ionic eigenstates. And once we have that, we can compute from its diagonal elements the populations of the ionic states that have been prepared by, by the ionization, as well as the degrees of coherence between two populated ionic states. And moreover, we can also compute if other quantities get characterized better for a many electron system with several ionic states, the degree of coherence of the system, for instance, the purity and the entanglement with the photoelectron that has been emitted, which is uh, computed, quantified by computing the von Neumann entropy of entanglement. So these are like uh, numeric, this is a theoretical tools that allow one to, to understand the coherence, the dynamics of the coherence in the system. And so just to summarize what are the theoretical ingredients that enter the simulation. So we have a description of electron correlation, for instance, inclusion of the shakeup states, of the electron relaxation, there's also relaxation satellite states are included. We have a, a, a modeling, uh, an accurate modeling of partial cross sections for all the electronic state uh, of the ion as a function of the ionic laser parameters. The, the process of the ionization process is described in a time dependent fashion, so we can monitor the formation and loss of the coherence. Uh, because we are dealing with an n electron wave function, we don't ignore the photoelectron, but the ion photoelectron entanglement and interaction is taken into account. And for instance, also the, 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 the residual interaction between the two, and so the, what is called correlation effects in the continuum. What is not taken into account is uh, relaxation processes such as Auger decay, because the model describes only one electron in the continuum at the time. Although these processes can be described in a sequential way or by introducing, for example, extra parameters in a semi-empirical way. And what is definitely not included in, yet in this, in, this, in this description, in this theoretical framework, is the coupling to the nuclear motion that, as we know, plays a, a fundamental role for time scales, let's say, above a few or 10 of femtoseconds, particularly non-adiabatic dynamics is not included. And so uh, the inclusion of that, of course, will lead to uh, what we all aim for, which is uh, a complete quantum knowledge of the many body state. And now I'll show you an example of, 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 uh, of, uh, of the, our application of, of the method to perform a, a simulation of a nanosecond pump probe experiment where we uh, take the pyrazine molecule, we first ionize it with a pump in an XUV pump pulse, and we create some charge dynamics, and then we aim to probe with uh, an X-ray probe uh, by computing the transit absorption spectrum of the molecule. Uh, and so we start by uh, describing the effect of the pump ionization. So the pump ionization, which the, pack, the spectral bandwidth is plot here, populates all the for all these ionic states of the ionic of the of the ionized pyrazine. So many states have been populated as a result of the pump ionization. Uh, so out of the among these states, uh, a, a sound degree of coherence has been created as well. 
And in this uh, 2D plot that <laughs> reminds a little bit of a kind of Kandinsky uh, painting, uh, I show uh, the 2D map of the degrees of coherence between each pair of ionic states of, uh, included in the simulation of, of, the P of, of Pilesin. As you see, there are highlands of coherence, of high degree of coherence close to the diagonal, meaning if two states, of course, have, uh, have a smaller energy gap, the degree of coherence between them will be higher than you know, if they're distant uh, more, for example, than the pulse bandwidth. This has to be expected for single photonization. And moreover, uh, here I plot the relative phases between each pair of ionic states. Uh, so just to, uh, to have a complete information about the ionic system that has been prepared, including the populations, the coherences between each pair of ionic eigenstates and the relative phase as well. Uh, and now uh, some more analysis to understand what this means practically in terms of dynamics, what we are used to describe as charge dynamics, and later in terms of observation. So in terms of charge dynamics, uh, a quantity that is useful to monitor is calculating the natural charge orbitals, which are presented here in the upper panel. And uh, as you see, uh, these, are, uh, com these are connected to the, charge, uh, uh, to the charge density of the system, which uh, evolves uh, between uh, at different times. And here you can see the, 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 the change of the charge density in the system. And here you can also observe the beatings. So the beatings at which this charge dynamics happens. And you, as you can see, you can recognize three different main beatings. So although the, the coherences in the system are, uh, are between many pairs of ionic eigenstates, actually the ionic dynamics is driven by three mainly main three coherences. And as you see also, you can also see a comparison between uh, the result of the full uh, ADC simulation and the result of a, of a, of a Sagden approximation simulation. And as you can see, for the, in the case of uh, an XUV pulse centered at 25 EV, so ionizing quite close to the thresholds of the, of the ionic system, uh, the, 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 the two results uh, differ uh, quite robust, in a quite robust way. So showing how it is important to include the effect of the, of the uh, photoelectron and of the laser field parameters when describing ionization at such photon energies. And here I can I show you also the, the effect of the interaction with the photoelectron. So, uh, in, the, in, the, in the upper panel, you can see the difference between the uh, natural charge orbitals uh, dynamics uh, with the full model and the uh, ones uh, calculated by neglecting the photoelectron after, uh, hundreds, at 170 attoseconds after the ionization. As you see, the two curves differ, meaning the, in, the, the photoelectron keeps interacting with the parent ion at later times. And this is because, as you can see, in this panel, the ionic coherences that drive the charge dynamics keep changing up to about one, two femtoseconds after ionization. And so the, the interaction lasts up to one or two femtoseconds. After then, the ionic coherence becomes almost stationary. And, and so the ionic, and so the charge dynamics also doesn't experience any, any, any change because of these interaction. Uh, so what is also a, a, not, a, a very powerful tool to simplify the, 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 the picture and to basically uh, unravel the, the, the dynamics that is uh, triggered uh, by the ionization event is to perform a, a so-called Smith decomposition of the ionic density matrix. This means diagonalizing the density matrices uh, and expand it uh, as, a, as a superposition, as a sum of, of different pure state channels which have a different way. And as you see, when this happens, uh, when this is applied to the case of pyrazine, you can see that there are a few uh, pure state channels that have quite a, 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 a prominent way. And, and, and these are like a few, like uh, in this case, there are six or seven. And then the weight uh, const, uh, starts to decrease uh, to become even lower than 1%. So what does this mean? This means that although the number of ionic channels that are open in this ionization are really a lot, like 50, potentially even more. The actual number of, of, of channel, of, of, of coherent channels that describe the dynamic 
uh, are in this case less than five. So this simplifies the picture quite a lot. Uh, and how can we probe them? So, uh, well, in order to probe them, we also need to model the, the interaction with the probe parts. In this case, because we are dealing with a density matrix, we need to then propagate the von Neumann equations for the density matrix. And so this is what I do for, uh, in, and I, try, I, I, I propagate in interact, allowing the, the ion to interact with a probe pulse centered at the um, uh, absorption energy, the nitrogen KH, and another probe pulse with photon energy centered for, uh, at the transition energy to the carbon KH. So, uh, the aim is to uh, promote the, wave the ionic wave packet to the carbon ionized or nitrogen ionized states. Uh, and when doing so, we can compute the energy integrated absorption. And this reveals, of the, 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 the its time dependence reveals the, the charge dynamics, which happens with partial resolution at nitrogen and at carbon. And as you can see, uh, is as well characterized by the two periods that I was talking about before, like a long uh, five femtoseconds period where the nitrogen and the carbon K edge signals uh, like oscillate in phase, and another faster period around alpha femtoseconds, which shows uh, an out of phase oscillation between the carbon and nitrogen signal, reflecting the fact that that time scale uh, is an oscillation between, of charge between the carbon and nitrogen atoms. And when we do the spectrally resolved analysis, we can see all the, we can resolve all the interference pattern uh, that arise uh, from the quantum beatings induced in the systems. And uh, by looking at the peaks in the Fourier transform, we can identify what are the, the ones, for example, that correspond to the coherences that drive the charge dynamics. This can be done both in the, in the carbon spectrum and in the nitrogen spectrum. Although, as you see, the nitrogen spectrum is quite more structured and, and apparently complicated than the carbon one, with many uh, different uh, peaks at the same uh, beatings. And why is that the case? The case is because these extra beatings arise from the population of the final two whole one particle core ionized states, which do not play any role in the carbon uh, okay, energy window, but they do in the nitrogen. And this is uh, verified by removing them from the simulation. And as you see, even the, uh, also the nitrogen KI spectrum simplifies to reveal only the beatings which um, are reflecting a transition to the main final core ionized states. And now the question is, so we, we, I showed you that uh, transit absorption can be used to monitor the dynamics and to probe some queries, but how many coherences that are induced in the system can we probe them? Can we actually probe them almost, can we probe almost all of them? Can we actually aim to reconstruct the full density matrix? Well, here I show you the example of carbon, which indeed, uh, where indeed the atom spectrum allows to, uh, to resolve all the beatings that correspond to the first uh, seven pure state channels that approximate the density matrix, meaning Oh, the only beatings that are not possible to be resolved are the ones that, um, um, let's say, are less than 1% relevant in the, to describe the ionic state that has been produced. Uh, and so here you can see uh, a mapping between the peaks that, we can, that you can measure in an ATAS uh, experiment and the coherences uh, that result from the uh, Schmidt decomposition of the density matrix. And with this, I arrived to my conclusions. So I basically showed you that the time dependent displinency method uh, describes um, many electron musician dynamics, including electron correlation and a full description of the photoelectron. And before, quantum coherence in the molecular cation can be calculated in an ab initio fashion for, as a function of the pulse parameters. I showed you that uh, going beyond the approximation is important when we uh, are dealing with uh, uh, low photon energies and, and therefore lower photoelectron energy as well. Uh, I presented a, a full ab initio simulation of a complete pump probe experiment showing that this is now possible in polyatomic molecules such as pyrazine. And I have showed you uh, 
that the ATAS experiment, the ATAS setup is a powerful scheme to retrieve the quantum electronic coherences that uh, are uh, prepared by uh, ATOS ionization and that predetermine uh, the subsequent charge-directed reactivity. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Okay. Uh, thank you for very nice uh, presentation. Uh, we have uh, a time a little for some question or some comment on your uh, presentation. Uh, until I get some question, I uh, want to ask you something. A uh, couple of times you uh, mentioned that you include electron correlation and uh, observe the influence of laser parameter on molecular dynamic and electron density and coherence. Uh, what your expert? I. Uh, uh, what is your opinion about uh, the level of uh, uh, influence of laser parameters, uh, how much we can uh, really include correlation, and what is our expectation about Auger decay? About You mentioned that you didn't include it yet in your consideration. Well, uh, the laser parameters uh, play a role in, in, in because uh, for example, if you are talking about single photon ionization, uh, depending on the on the spectral bandwidth, uh, of course, uh, different coherences can or cannot be created in the ionic system, and so different beatings in the dynamics. Uh, also, the, the 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 values of the of the of the frequencies uh, uh, will determine uh, the relative populations of the ionic states, because each ionic state has a cross section, as a partial cross section, which depends. On the photon energy. So, in this sense, even in single photonization, the, the pulse structure the, uh, is quite important to, to, for, for a quantitative prediction of the, of the dynamics. Uh, and of course, if we are talking about um, multi photon ionization, uh, even more. As far as OGDK uh, is concerned, of course, this affects only uh, the states that are above the double ionization threshold. Um, now, in the, case, in, the, in the study that I presented, they don't play any role. They are uh, ionized uh, uh, as well, but they don't, not in a relevant way. Uh, same for the really inner balance uh, states that are close to the double ionization thresholds, which are the ones that, for, for instance, you can probe by uh, further ionizing the system with an IR probe. Um, so, in a sense, it depends on how the, um, the measurement is performed. If the measurement is such that focuses exclusive, exclusively on, the on, on those states that either Roger decay or would like to Roger decay, then yes, describing that is important. If the, if the measurement does not, then no. I mean, I, I think the measurement can tailor different if we, we have measurements techniques that allow you to tailor different ionic states. Violetta, there are a couple of questions. I'm okay. not sure if you can see them or do you want me to read them? Please, please, because I can see them. That's all right. Um, so we have a question from Hans Jacob Werner and the question is, can your methods be applied to strong field ionization by infrared pulses? Yes, thank you for your question, Jacob. Uh, yes, it can. Um, uh, and uh, I already I, 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 I applied it to the strong field ionization of, uh, of CO2 and a work published two years ago. Uh, in that case, uh, only um, states in the outer balance were included in the calculation. So there were no shake-up states, but this was mainly because strong field ionization uh, you know, only allows you to effectively populate state with a smaller ionization potential. So yeah, to summarize, yes, it can, it can be applied also to strong field ionization. Of course, computationally, that's uh, much more demanding. And perhaps uh, I will have to have a think about if that can be done for a molecule as 
large as pyrazine, <laughs> but in principle, yes. There is another question, Violetta, if we still have time. Okay. Um, so Gilbert Grell says, Marco, very nice talk, thank you. Can you estimate how much the Schmidt purification of the density matrix lowers the computational effort for the solution of the von Neumann equation? Uh, thank you very much for your question. I, uh, I don't know because uh, uh, in this case, I um, performed the Smith purification in order to, um, let's say, clarify the picture, the physical picture, what is really going on in the system. But uh, numerically, I still uh, um, solved the von Neumann equations by propagating the, the full density matrix. Because in this case, the density matrix was, uh, the size of it was, was affordable. Uh, but of course, um, the simplification is, is, is dramatic if you think that in this case, out of uh, uh, 80 ionic states that I included in the, in the initial calculation, you can end up with uh, four or five um, uh, different states in a rotated basis. So we are talking about uh, like 5% less effort at least. So yes, it can simplify a lot, if possible. Okay. Do we have any questions? Uh, not at the moment. Uh, these were all the questions available okay. on the platform. Okay, thank you. And once again, I want to thank to Marco for the interesting the presentation. Uh, for the question can found uh, after ses session in the discussion for logs, I suppose. And now we have uh, our la last speaker, uh, Dr. Attila Bede, and uh, his lecture. Uh, laser induced molecule excitation using real uh, time, time dependent density functional theory. Attila. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, yes, uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, inviting me to this very interesting uh, post action. Uh, special thank you for Professor uh, Laszlo Nagy and uh, Fernando Martin. And today uh, I will talk uh, about modeling laser induced molecular excitation using real time time-dependent density functional theory. We, uh, I work together with my friend Valer uh, Tosha on this work. Uh, here is my outline. I will talk briefly about the theoretical framework of the real-time TDDFT. I will- Sorry for uh, interrupting. There is no presentation on screen. If you'd like to share your screen, please. Thank you. Uh, sorry, share screen. Okay. No, it's okay. Yes, we can see that now. Thank you. Sorry. So, uh, okay. uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this very interesting uh, cost action and special to Professor Laszlo Nagy and to so Fernando Martin, and today I will talk about uh, modeling laser-induced molecule excitation using real-time time-dependent density functional theory work, what uh, we do together with uh, Valer Tosha. Uh, here is my uh, outline. Um, in first step, I will talk about the theoretical framework of the real-time TDDFT. I will present some uh, quantum chemistry codes where this uh, uh, method uh, was implemented. And uh, in the last three um, steps, I will show some uh, application of, of this uh, theory regarding the UV spectra, orbital transitions, and the uh, different uh, role of laser field parameters in molecular excitation. So, why uh, time-dependent density functional theory? Um, 
is because the, the classical TDDFT developed by, uh, by uh, Gross uh, considers the linear response regime where only a very small external field perturbation is taken into account and the excitation energies are considered as a pole of the response function. Uh, in this case, uh, they are not taking into account the real pulse duration, for example, or pulse shape, pulse shape laser frequency, laser uh, field polarization, and uh, laser intensity. Uh, so uh, apart from uh, this problem of, uh, of TDDFT and special exchange correlation functionals, they have uh, also some limits for uh, of the classical TDDFT theory. Uh, they can uh, calculate only a small number of roots uh, exactly. Um, we call low-lying excited states. Uh, uh, it not take into account the nonlinear regime, the response regime. It cannot be applied for high laser intensity regime. Um, it is uh, the eternal problem of the exchange correlation functionals also gives the problem of charge and charge transfer excitations. Uh, and also transitions with double excitation characters cannot be kept with uh, this TDDFT. And uh, uh, in the past, it was a problem also with the core electron excitation. Nowadays, uh, they are uh, mainly solved this problem. So all of these uh, limitations can be uh, overcome by uh, considering uh, uh, so some of these uh, uh, limitations can be overcome by considering the real-time time propagation techniques, uh, which in fact uh, starts with uh, time-dependent uh, Schrodinger equation uh, in, and after many uh, uh, mathematical operations uh, and um, changing from the wave function descriptions to the density description, we uh, obtain the so-called uh, von Neumann equation uh, as is shown uh, at the bottom of the, of the presentation uh, where uh, the, the time dependent, the time propagation of the density is obtained uh, using the Fock operator and the, the density. Okay. Um, and also, I apologize if I become a little bit technically. Um, here you can show the, the time dependent function equation uh, with the well known uh, components of the exchange correlation and the, uh, the external potential. And uh, uh, if we propagate the density of this function equation, in ideal case, uh, we need to keep. Uh, all densities for all uh, time steps in order to describe uh, 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 correctly the, the density propagation. Of course, this is not possible, so we have to make some uh, approximations and, uh, and uh, also uh, the, the, one of the major problems uh, when we use uh, hybrid functionals is that the XA, X, exact uh, Hartree-Fock exchange uh, depend on the full uh, density matrix and it is important to be propagated uh, uh, the full density matrix for, for matrix for this case. But uh, in, in summary, the, the most important problem is the time propagation. And um, for example, the well-known uh, Euler and second order runge kutta methods are not suitable anymore. Uh, and mostly because uh, we have a strong non-linearity in, in the time propagations. And uh, uh, the, uh, for this reason, we need a, a more performant time propagation methods where um, I can mention uh, two uh, this uh, time propagations uh, propagators. One of them are the Mangus, uh, Magnus propagator. Uh, you can see uh, here different order of the of the Mangus uh, Magnus operator and also the modified uh, midpoint algorithm. Uh, some working formula. Here is the von Neumann equation and uh, 
the Hamiltonian is considered as the Kohn-Sham uh, Fock matrix and the external uh, field, and here U is the, the time propagator um, of uh, this Hamiltonian, and uh, the Magnus uh, first and second order uh, propagators uh, are expressed in, uh, in the integral formalis, uh, where of the of the Fock uh, operator. Uh, also for the modified midpoint algorithm, uh, this is a little bit more um, simplified uh, propagator scheme. Um, the most important thing is that the density at the n plus one step can be expressed as the density of the uh, density in function of the Fock operator in step n and the density at step n minus one. Uh, we uh, can now uh, uh, connect with the external laser field where the, the interaction uh, operator between the molecules and the external laser field is uh, considered in the dipole approximation. Uh, and uh, the external field is considered as a, as a time dependent sinusoidal function with uh, an external field amplitude E. Uh, also, we can define the, the orbital occupation number, uh, both for uh, occupied orbitals and uh, unoccupied orbitals. And we can define the so-called fractional population for virtual orbitals, but in similar uh, manner also for the occupied uh, orbitals. Uh, and um, we can uh, calculate also the, the transition dipole moment or the instantaneous dipole moment. And using this dipole moment, we can uh, very uh, easily obtain the theoretical UV uh, spectra. Uh, some words about the quantum chemistry codes. Uh, um, one of the most important codes are NV chem. Uh, where uh, the group of uh, Niri Govind uh, implement uh, this uh, framework, they use the second order Magnus uh, time propagator, and which is very important, uh, they succeed to implement um, this method also for hybrid DFT functionals, which is very important uh, when we want to uh, treat the charge transfer for a very long distance. Uh, uh, inside the molecule. They also implement uh, several type of uh, pulses. Uh, of course, the, if, uh, when we want to compute the, the theoretical UV spectra, we use the so-called quick field, but also some uh, real uh, pulses like Gaussian, hand type, and monochromatic continuous uh, wave. The, another very important uh, software is Octopus. Uh, developed by Rubio and co-workers. <laughs> uh, here, uh, uh, as the time propagator, um, uh, the Magnus uh, uh, third order or fourth uh, order uh, operators are included and is also compatible uh, with the DeepXC uh, library for ex uh, exchange correlation functionals. Um, as well, they are, uh, they are implement uh, many uh, different pulse profiles, uh, starting from the well-known uh, continuous wave and Gaussian envelope, but also the so-called uh, user-defined profile, which are very important uh, when we have, um, for example, uh, profiles uh, which uh, derive from uh, high harmonic generations. Uh, another program, but unfortunately they are not developed uh, anymore uh, further the, the uh, real-time TDDFT uh, theory is um, the MOLPRO um, developed by uh, Mambi group, only this part of the uh, TDDFT. Uh, and they use the modified midpoint algorithm and uh, unfortunately is not suitable for uh, hybrid uh, DFT functionals. Uh, because of lack of uh, ex uh, exact uh, Hartree-Fock exchange. They also implement 
several type of uh, laser buses. Uh, sorry. Uh, so now let's uh, see uh, the applications. Um, uh, the most simple case is the electronic absorption spectra or the UV spectra. And uh, um, the group of uh, Neely Govin um, shown that uh, for a classical linear response, uh, the first 200 roots are uh, in the very narrow regime of, uh, of, of, the, of the spectra. So in order uh, to compute a larger uh, energy domain of the, of, the, of the electronic absorption spectra, uh, the linear response uh, theory is not uh, uh, usable anymore. So the real time uh, uh, version was able to compute a much larger uh, UV uh, spectra for uh, this P3B2 uh, molecules. Actually, what we obtain um, usually uh, when we use the linear response theory, we have, uh, as you can see here, uh, the, sorry, uh, the poles. But with the real time time dependent theory, uh, you can obtain the whole envelope of the of the spectra. Uh, let to see uh, the real cases. Uh, uh, we use uh, for this case the Molpro software, uh, considering the Minnesota 11 uh, uh, functionals in its uh, local version uh, and. Uh, the DFT, uh, DF2 TZVT uh, triple Z valence basis set with polarization function. Uh, the frequency of the pulse, uh, the central frequency of the pulse was uh, 254. The time, um, uh, the pulse time was 21 femtosecond and the pulse form uh, was uh, a trap form. Just for curiosity, uh, even in this case, we can obtain the, the, the uh, absorption spectra, but uh, um, they are not a pure uh, UV spectra, since uh, also uh, the, the presence of, of the laser pulse, the frequency of laser pulse is is, um, is in the spectra actually not only the free oscillation of the of the molecular dipole gives uh, the spectral shape but also the uh, oscillation induced by the by the poor pulse so uh, we play a little bit with the data collection and uh, here uh, we uh, calculate uh, the same spectra using different time um, delays of the of the data collections. Uh, the black one is uh, when we uh, start to collect uh, the data immediately when the pulse uh, stopped. Uh, the red one uh, is after 10 femtoseconds time delay, um, and the, the blue one is after 20 femtoseconds time delay. Uh, so um, you can see that um, the, the spectral shape uh, induced by the, by the laser excitation, laser frequency is uh, drastically reduced uh, when we uh, include um, the so-called um, time delay uh, for data collecting. Uh, about the assignment of excitation in, uh, in terms of molecular orbitals. Uh, here in this table, you can see um, uh, the first four excited state for the, for the acetophenone molecules. Um, the first uh, excited state is a, is a dark state. Uh, so we work, um, we, we use the, the second excited state to compare um, the orbital excitations uh, between the linear response and the real time time dependent. And uh, the linear response tell us that uh, we have um, excitation from uh, homo minus one to lumo and homo minus two to lumo orbitals. 
uh, with the real time TDDFT, we were able to reproduce uh, the same excitations. Um, for example, here as the um, homo minus one and homo minus two, and in, in other, and for the LUMO, they are LUMO orbitals and LUMO plus one. But um, it was very interesting that uh, we, we were able to reproduce also these small contributions of uh, homo minus one to LUMO plus one ex excitations. Uh, we did the same uh, analysis for uh, S4 state, <clears throat> and we uh, also reproduce the homo minus one to LUMO excitations, what uh, we observed in linear response case. But uh, also the homo minus one to LUMO plus one uh, excitations are uh, quite uh, uh, intense in, in our. Uh, real-time picture, which uh, in case of linear response uh, has only a small contribution. We will see uh, the, the reason of these uh, discrepancies if uh, uh, when we analyze the, the same excitation for 5-benzene uh, uracil using almost the same uh, uh, pulse setup, uh, linear response uh, gave us a very strong homo minus three to LUMO excitation, uh, but in the case of uh, real time TDDFT, we were we uh, reproduced only in uh, in a small part the the this type of excitation. Uh, we got a strong excitation from homo to LUMO and homo minus one to LUMO. The reason is that uh, our real pulse uh, has uh, the full width maximum of 21 nanometers, which means uh, not uh, a, a frequency domain of 244 and 264 uh, nanometers. And in this case, um, uh, the 5BU has uh, close to the S2 states uh, also uh, uh, another excited state, S3, which has uh, this uh, excitation scheme. So uh, in, in this case, we can say that uh, the excitation is not uh, connected uh, by uh, single um, electronic transitions um, using this, uh, this kind of, of rear pulses. We can excite uh, several uh, electron uh, uh, excitations uh, if, uh, they are uh, staying very closely. Uh, we play uh, with uh, laser field parameters also um, for these uh, three um, molecular systems, acetophenone, a 5 benzyl and 6 benzyl And uh, the first case is uh, the study of frequency. We use uh, four different uh, frequencies. Uh, of 240, 55, uh, 70, and uh, 290. And we um, follow the, the population of the HOMO minus two, HOMO minus one, and HOMO as well, the LUMO, LUMO plus one, and LUMO plus two orbitals. And uh, uh, we uh, got very complex uh, electron excitations uh, for different frequencies. Uh, which uh, also is connected to the to the one electron transitions uh, of uh, of uh, uh, different uh, electronic excitations. Uh, it's very important uh, to mention that uh, the value of two hundred ninety is uh, uh, is below uh, to the first uh, excited state or the, the second excited state of, of the. 5 benzyl uracil. 5 benzyl uracil has um, uh, the, uh, five, uh, the first excited state of the 5 benzyl uracil has a very small oscillator strength. Uh, and uh, using uh, this frequency, um, the excitation of, uh, of the molecule uh, was uh, almost uh, zero. We have only a small population of HOMO and nothing else, as you can see. But other frequencies which are resonant with S1, S2, or S3 frequencies 
give a much uh, stronger um, uh, uh, pop uh, population of the of the orbitals. Um, um, after that, so we observe that um, the molecular excitation of the, in this case, the six benzene uracil um, can be localized on the CO bond of the molecule. So we try to orient this uh, CO bond um, along to the, the laser field direction. And uh, we see that uh, if it is along to the CO bond, the laser direction is along the CO, we have a very strong excitation uh, with a strong uh, uh, depopulation of the, of the HOMO and a strong population of the LUMO. And here uh, are collected, uh, summarized the, the last <coughs> seven uh, HOMO orbital populations and the the first nine uh, unoccupied virtual uh, orbital populations. Uh, so uh, we have a very strong excitation for this case. But when uh, the laser uh, field is oriented perpendicular to the CO bond, we have a very, very small uh, absorption. Uh, so this means that uh, the, the molecular orientation is very, very important when we uh, want to excite uh, uh, our molecular system. Uh, another aspect is the laser field intensity. We use um, uh, for a two, a three type of intensities, uh, as uh, you can show here, which is uh, connected by the, the uh, amplitude of the electric field. The first, uh, the second one is 2.5 times larger than the first one, and the third one is um, four times larger than the, the first one. So you can see that uh, the orbitals are populated more uh, intensely if uh, uh, with the as the laser field intensity increase. Uh, and uh, in case of acetophenone, we observed a very interesting uh, spect. Uh, 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 for example, after 10, 11 femtoseconds, uh, not only the last seven uh, occupied orbitals are uh, uh, the electrons from the last uh, occupied or seven occupied orbitals are excited, but also uh, lower uh, occupied orbitals uh, are involved in the excitation. And uh, they are excited um, to uh, higher um, occupied orbitals than the first uh, nine uh, LUMO orbitals. So as we increase uh, the intensity, uh, the lower uh, orbitals and the lower occupied orbitals and the higher um, unoccupied orbitals uh, will be involved in the excitation scheme. Um, and uh, some um, uh, laser pulse shapes, uh, we, uh, we consider two um, continuous wave uh, uh, and uh, for uh, Gauss uh, type uh, pulses and uh, the Gauss type pulses show a saturation of the, of the, the electron, fraction electron excitation while the, the continuous uh, trap uh, uh, excites uh, electrons uh, in the whole duration of the, of the, the pulse. Uh, other, um, Results that uh, were obtained uh, using this uh, real-time uh, TDBFT methods. We have to mention the the, the work of Kumel, uh, and it is very, very important. He study the uh, exit, the coupling of the excited states between uh, two uh, porphyrin-like molecules is called the CLA. Uh, in order to study the so-called um, First, uh, uh, resonant uh, energy transition, and uh, 
he observed that the dipole dipole approximation, which is, uh, is in the first year theory, is not valid uh, for uh, shorter um, intermolecular distance. So the full uh, column uh, coupling uh, must be taken into account between uh, the densities. And here, uh, uh, Joachim Sornet and Somoza. Uh, uh, apply this uh, RTTFT theory for um, uh, large biological uh, systems and um, show uh, the propagation of the of the excited states over uh, uh, long uh, uh, long di longer distances. Uh, for um, compressive review articles, uh, I can recommend. Uh, the, the critical review art, article of uh, Olopata and Lorind and me. Um, his very um, recent uh, paper it, uh, is, uh, is still in print in chemical review. And another interesting review article is in Wires um, uh, journal published by Ali and co workers. And as a conclusion, uh, I can um, say that um, the real-time time-dependent uh, method is suitable to follow the, mostly the population dynamics in time. Um, we can also identi identify uh, the nature of excitations uh, considering different orbital transitions. Um, it can be compute uh, larger uh, absorption spectra and wider energy domain for and for a wider energy domain, and also is important to see uh, uh, different laser parameters how can um, uh, induce uh, excitation in in our molecular systems. There are also some limitations. Um, all these calculations uh, were taken in account in the uh, for the rigid molecular geometry. As I know, um, the octopus program now can um, perform also uh, nuclear uh, dynamics coupled with this uh, RTTBFT uh, method. And um, uh, it is possible to use only one um, simple laser pool setup, but uh, sometimes we need to, to have a more complex uh, laser setup. And uh, also, the eternal problem of the of the exchange correlation functionals, which is also present for uh, for this uh, theoretical framework, um, they are two articles uh, where uh, this uh, problem of failing uh, to describe uh, different processes. Um, uh, for example, for charge transfers uh, effects at long distance. Um, it's connected by the wrong description of the uh, of the uh, for, given by the exchange correlation pot, uh, potentials. And uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, Attila, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we have a little bit of time. Uh, do we have any question? Uh, not at the moment on the platform, but people take a little bit of time to type. Okay, uh, because we are very close to, to the end, uh, I have a little question about, uh, for you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, octopus is suitable for, uh, I uh, think, a linearly polarized laser field. I saw linear polarization when you spoke about uh, external field and uh, molecular properties. Uh, Am no, I no, not, not only for the linear. Uh, depend on the on the pulse. So, yeah, uh, of course, um, you're right. <laughs> okay, um, only one uh, uh, direction is uh, is uh, taken into account in, in the pulse scheme. So there is a linear pulse, of course. You, we can change the polarization and take. Uh, the, only the direction uh, you can test. Okay. Okay. Uh, the MOLPRO has implemented uh, 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 for two directions, so you can choose a, a liner polarization, uh, uh, circular polarization uh, field okay. also. Okay. 
Any question more? If, there are no questions on the platform. Okay. If we have any question, have any question. Uh, on the end, I want again thanks to all our speakers, and I'm sorry because of my technical issues, but uh, I uh, hope that it uh, presentations was uh, interesting for our uh, participants. Uh, so we now finish our session. Thank you.